Welcome to the Lover's Hole. You're with Mike and Ian. And we are rereading the Aubrey Matron books of Patrick O'Brien. Ian, catch us up to date here. Well, Mike, the last time we were in Chapter 2, and Jack, with the help of Stephen and with the notice of all the rest of the crew, had met his natural son, Sam. Sam Panda, son of Sally, um, Jack's shoreside African girl fling from clearly two decades ago. So Jack and Stephen had been talking about their admiration for Sam and their concerns about him. Stephen had been operating on the flagship's surgeon who had a tumour of growth inside him. That sounded like that was not going well as the surprise departed. Meanwhile, Jack, as a member of a court-martial sitting on a bunch of mutineers, had been having a real horrible time suffering through this court-martial, really a trial with a foregone conclusion. And I think we might come back to the idea of trials with foregone conclusions a bit later in the story. Meanwhile, they've departed Bridgetown. Jack is hoping to meet the Spartan, a privateer, on the way home. And maybe, Mike, this could be the chapter when we find her because everyone is looking forward to some kind of a victory. Everyone knows that this is probably the surprise's final voyage as a warship in commission. The crew, however, are casting doubts on whether Jack's luck is still in. They're really hoping that maybe an encounter with this Spartan privateer might turn up their luck. And we're going to encounter Spartan, or at least the idea of her, three times. So, Mike, I guess we'd better buckle Ooh, up for this chapter. Right, right. Yeah, this is, this is, and, and yeah. I'm sure we'll talk about it as we go along. This is a fascinating chapter. O'Brien starts us out by getting us right into it. He writes, if it had not been for the prospect of meeting with a French or American sloop, corvette, or frigate, or with a privateer, this last leg of their journey would have been a sad one. For it was indeed a last leg, a run that probably would take the surprise to the breaker's yard. And O'Brien, he's kind of setting us up here. He, he talks about the surprise's crew, how united they are, how they can all attest to her speed, you know, one of the fastest of her class in the Navy, her sound timbers, how happy and healthy and weatherly she is, despite having been built in the 1780s. And he reminds us that, you know, frigates have gotten much bigger. They carry much heavier weight of metal, you know, bigger guns. And, and Surprise really can't compete against any of today's American ships. And that the French sloops or corvettes, which, you know, she really could take on, rarely come out of the blockade and offer no glory and victory, only disgrace in defeat. But even though there's no real glory in taking a privateer, O'Brien writes, that taking an unusually heavy and powerful privateer like the notorious Spartan, and boy, this thing is, yeah, we're getting really top billing for the Spartan, who we'd never heard of before, but boy, this chapter, she is the thing. That would be a thoroughly credible thing and round off the surprises commission handsomely. So we learned that the Spartan is new. It's built by an excellent yard. If taken, it would likely be bought into the British service, provided that it's not badly damaged. And that there's five quid a knob to pay for her numerous crew in head money here. So I don't know, Ian, what do you think? Well, I think it sounds like we're led to expect there's going to be action. We're led to expect that we're going to encounter this spawn and that we're going to be vying for a decisive victory over her. This is a big deal for Jack. It's a big deal for the whole crew. And I'm going to say no more other than, let's remember, this is A, a Patrick O'Brien novel, and B, yeah. chapter three. <laughs> oh, so. those are two great. This is a trigger warning, but, you know, we've been through this thing enough. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes, we have. O'Brien says that the crew were looking out for the Spartan with more than their usual zeal, in spite of the fact that many of them felt that luck had gone out of the ship. Or if not out of her, then out of her captain, which was much the same thing. And then like, we get this really fascinating kind of discursive exploration of all the superstitions that had been attached to this voyage and superstitions that the crew, especially the older, more experienced hands, that the crew hold really dear. And these are also, you know, superstitions attaching to the ship and superstitions attaching to the luck or the conduct of the captain. 
And we hear that it was the former fishermen and the former whalers among the crew who felt these superstitions most strongly. They'd seen the same crews in two different ships, but fishing the same waters in the same season on the same voyage, come away one with nothing and one with her holds overflowing. They see luck as ebbing and flowing like the tides for reasons that they either didn't know or wanted to keep some you know mystique and mystery about. And the text says, luck and unluck were held to have little or nothing to do with virtue or vice, amiability or its reverse. Luck was not a matter of deserts. It was a free gift, like beauty in a very young woman, independent of the person it adorned. Interesting. Though just as beauty could be spoiled by frizzed hair and the like, so ill luck could certainly be provoked by given forms of conduct such as wanton pride, boasting of success, or impious disregard for custom. And we get a bit more, Mike, about well, what do we mean by impious disregard for custom? Because we've had a couple of them aboard ship previously on this voyage or already on this voyage. First of all, carrying Parsons aboard ship was regarded as unlucky. And yet it says, here was Mr. Martin. Reverend Martin was a good, kindly gent, not at all proud, nor above lending the doctor a hand in the sick bay or writing an official letter for a man or learning the boys to read. But he was a parson and there was no denying it. And Mike, it's noticeable all of this reported speech here is from the point of view of the foredeck hands, right? The foremast hands. This is from the point of view of the regular men. Right. Even worse, the crew believed that Jack had shipped a Jonah, the unlucky character. This was Mr. Hollum. And back on the far side of the world, we heard the story of Mr. Hollum. And this brought an even greater curse when the gunner killed his wife and killed her lover, this Mr. Hollum, and then hanged himself. Right. Some believe that the curse had been lifted when the gunner went over the side with round shot at head and foot. But Joe Place, the oldest and most respected of the prophets of woe, listed his version of signs that it had not been listed, this curse. The last prize had been taken just inside Admiral Pellew's command. That had cost the captain $8,000 and the crew uh, a corresponding amount. The doctor, known for his successes, just like Joe Place's head that he'd trepanned, had likely lost his last patient. This was the the other surgeon that Stephen had operated on. The final sign, the final misfortune, Sam Panda's visit to Ashgrove Cottage to Sophie and perhaps to Mother Williams is a clear sign of misfortune. And they're like, Sophie for sure, Mrs. Aubrey could not have mistaken the face, the appearance of Sam. And the, the crew are pretty sure that they know what kind of view Sophie Aubrey would have had of this appearance of Sam Panda. So I love, Mike, this discussion. We go back to an old favourite subject of O'Brien's, which is superstition among naval sailors. And it re-emphasises, I think, Jack's connection to the crew and their connection to him. The high regard and the high kind of mutual dependence and respect that they have between Jack and the crew. Yeah, yeah. And for some of these guys, that connection, as you point out earlier, it goes a little deeper because many of them worked, you know, they worked at Melbury Lodge with Jack and Stephen earlier in the post-captain days. They worked at Ashgrove Cottage. And so a lot of these folks, especially the old timers, the ones that have followed Jack ever, they know Sophie. They yeah. really like Sophie. In fact, O'Brien writes, they respected her to an almost religious degree because they had known many amiable and respectable women. And they knew, he said, that she was her mother's daughter. And unlike her mother, O'Brien writes, Sophie never scolded, roared, or bawled. No hard words, no turning out of doors, no assurances of eternal damnation. But she was her mother's daughter in this, though in this alone, that she would have no truck, no truck whatsoever with anything in the roving line. The getting of bastards might be fashionable, but it would not do for Mrs. Aubrey. So clearly, Sam turning up to Sophie was clearly unlucky. I think Joe Place would say, case closed here. <laughs> yeah. And interestingly, in this conversation that's going on between Joe Place and Killick and Barrett Bonden, there's a, a little bit of superstition piled on superstition. Um, Killick calls out Joe Place for running afoul of this superstition about naming calls. This is a phrase that's come up before. I think it came up in HMS Surprise 
naming calls seems to suggest that it's a it's unlucky to name something explicitly in conversation. So we went looking. We went looking online for what the origin of this might be. And in fact, in reference to the uh, O'Brien books, on wordreference.com, I don't know if the user matching mole is still out there or if you're listening to the podcast, but you came up with a really nice definition of this. This user said, I believe the phrase comes from the philosopher Heidegger. Yeah, philosophy, that sounds like good territory for us, right? Whose main obsession was the question of existence, um, though it might be possible that he himself got the phrase from an earlier source. Heidegger wrote, the naming calls. Calling brings closer what it calls. However, this bringing closer does not fetch what is called in order to set it down in closest proximity to what is present to find a place for it there. The call does indeed call. Thus, it brings the presence of what was previously uncalled into a nearness. Whoa. So Heidegger believes that invoking the name of something makes it present not only in the everyday real sense, but in the kind of metaphysical sense as well. <laughs> um, this user goes on to quote Wikipedia on Heidegger. Um, some regard him as the greatest philosopher of the 20th century, while others review his writing as bombastic nonsense. And says this user, I vote bombastic nonsense. So, Mike, I guess our, we and our readers will have to make our own judgment about Heidegger, right? Right. Well, and this whole thing about superstition. I mean, in all the fairy stories and, and the ilk, we always know, you know, you never tell anybody your true name because... Yeah. The name is power. We go back to the, the start of the Bible where God's kind of creating everything. And by the time we get to the beginning of the New Testament, you know, you look at Genesis 1, 1 versus John 1, 1, we're now with the Greeks and the Greeks believe this too, that this name is powerful. So, you know, in the beginning is the word, it's the word, it's the name, the logos. So yeah, this, this is pretty powerful stuff. And clearly, like you say here, just as place is about to sort of say, case closed, Killick's going, no, no, no. And everybody's saying, yeah, stop, stop, Joe, don't, don't name it. Yeah. Amazing. It's great, isn't it? And of course, being seamen, the men who live in the present, after having this little dialogue, they're willing to mostly let it slide. They don't want to dwell on this feeling. And O'Brien writes, they reconciled the irreconcilable, perhaps even more easily than landsmen. And in a ship that could not come to good, they looked out very eagerly for her next victim, her next success. So they were super happy with the prize money that they'd already made. They for sure wanted to make more and ideally make it out of the range of the grasping clutches of an admiral. For once, they were not in a tearing hurry. So as O'Brien says, the noble pyramids of canvas, the sails, the rigging, did not go to extraordinary measures to get speed out of them. Jack was pacing the quarterdeck, thinking about getting home. He's thinking about his legal affairs, his financial affairs. He realizes he's got no new information. Like we heard in the previous chapters, there was no mail in Bridgetown for the surprise, apart from one letter that Sam brought from Sophie that he'd already received. On optimistic days... Jack could think of all of this and it would bring up the subject of Sophie in his mind and he would think up about, you know, think of his pledge to her that she should have no right to complain. And he thought, well, now he's thinking about the arrival of Sam Panda and he thinks, well, if Mrs. Williams brings it up, I'll just tell her never to mention it again. I'll tell her to basically shut up and cool her jets <laughs> as right. if speaking to a defaulter. And he says to himself, otherwise there would be no peace in the house at all. So Jack is feeling like he's got reason to be confident when he finally gets on the home turf. Yeah, certainly. On, on his optimistic days, he does. I think the yeah, other yeah. days, he's just walking those miles off going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? And O'Brien comes back, like you say, he says that there's these optimistic days. And he tells us there's some other days when Jack isn't worried at all, too. Some calm days. He'd swim and he'd float, and I, and I love this, O'Brien says, with an infinity of pure sea on either hand and the whole hemisphere of sky above, already full of light, and then the sun would heave up on the eastern rim, turning the sails a brilliant white in quick succession, changing the sea to still another nameless blue and filling his heart with joy. Oh. So, ah, I love this. You know, Jack kind of like, with all this stuff on him, 
There he is. He's out in the sea. And Brian kind of lists here all these things that are giving him joy here. He's, he's been watching Stephen and Martin doing these collections, their specimens through the Sargasso Sea. He's been spending time with the younger gentlemen, noting how their schooling is progressing, their seamanship is coming along, how they survived the high southern latitudes despite losing toes and bits of ears. <laughs> they lived through scurvy, you know, even Howard losing all of his teeth, some of them losing just a few. And he watched them grow. And despite their interaction now, they're coming right in direct contact with, so Brian writes, violent death, adultery, and self murder. They still can skip about the ropes. They still act their age. They still, despite being really well along in their training, they still are kids. And and he loves them. He looked around and sees all these stores. You know, he spent so much time in the far side of the world. Can I use this little bit of rope? I don't have anything left if I use this final thing. Now he's just this incredible abundance and embarrassment of riches that the Bridgetown shipyard had given him, the Admiral had provided with him. And he's bought in his own supplies. So, gosh, it's been a lot of books, I think, since Jack could invite the officers to his Mm. cabin, really kind of entertain them in the, as O'Brien says, the traditional way. And then O'Brien kind of really nails it at the end. He says, but his greatest satisfaction, that is Jack's greatest satisfaction, was, of course, his ship. It seemed to him that she had never sailed so sweetly that her people had never worked so well and heartily together. He knew that this was almost certainly the last leg of her voyage, and he had known that she was mortal for quite a great while now, and the knowledge had become kind of a quiet heartbreak, always in the background, so that at present he took very particular notice of her excellence and of each day he passed on her. And, and I just, I thought, man, what a great way to think about your life. Okay, we're all mortal. <laughs> you know, those medieval philosophers that used to have that you know, skull sitting on their desk to remind ourselves, you know, that we're mortal. So that means we take each day and look for the wonderful things in it. Wow. I think I'm going to tuck this in my heart with my meditation practice, such as it is. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Yeah, it's great. And a really great uh, to use the 21st century word, mindfulness from yes. Jack. Yes. And he's, a, he's aware that he's got many things. He possesses many things in abundance, uh, but I think we're invited to see them as temporary or fragile. Some of those are going to have real importance. Let's think about what's in his inventory right now. He possesses a loyal, albeit superstitious, crew. He possesses command within the Royal Navy of a delightful ship with excellent stores. He possesses an unusually accomplished and kind of biddable set of midshipmen. He possesses, he thinks, pro tem, the goodwill of his wife. He possesses, he thinks, the moral authority to outface his very forbidding mother-in-law. He possesses 10,000 pounds. Right. He possesses all these things. And I think we're given this inventory in this chapter and invited to wonder, how many of these things can he hang on to now and for how long? Yeah. And and we know that Jack on land and Jack on sea are two different people and we're headed for land. So I think yeah. you raise a great question, Ian. Yeah. And I think just, just like Jack, we enjoy a little moment of the beautiful portrait of being happy and at sea. And O'Brien falls back on all of his regular staples of describing right. the cadence of life aboard. We're in blue water sailing. We've got cleaning and pumping and piping up hammocks and piping to breakfast and exercises and noon observations and grog. And we've got the gun room dinner. We've got afternoon work and supper and more grog. And then the text says, and then quarters with the thunderous great guns flashing and roaring in the twilight. The immemorial sequence punctuated by bells was so quickly and firmly restored that it might never have been broken. And I think we're invited to hear the sentence running on and might never be broken if right. if all was well. This was the sort of sailing that everybody was used to. And we hear that the routine of the crew and the food and the meals, and it's all just kind of falling into this really loved uh, pattern of naval life afloat. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, even to the point where we can now tell what day of the week it is by what we're having for supper. You know, no more of this crazy dolphin sausage stuff and everything else. So. <laughs> uh, or pickled penguins and, you know, whatever they were yeah. eating in, in far side of the world there. Yeah. Uh, O'Brien writes, it all gave a pleasant illusion of eternity, this quiet sailing under a perfect sky towards a horizon perpetually five miles ahead. 
never nearer. But at the same time, every man aboard, apart from the Gibraltar lunatics and one homegrown innocent called Henry, every man knew that there was no permanence about it at all. For one thing, the paying off pennant was already being prepared, a splendid silk streamer, the length of the ship, and more that was to be hoisted the day she went out of commission and all her people paid at last, changed from members of a tight-knit community to solitary individuals. Wow. This got me a little bit here. And and yeah. even with all this in mind, this kind of ever-present knowledge, everybody is working to beautify the surprise. You know, they're all thinking if she's got to be laid up in ordinary, you go to the breaker's yard, she's going in style. And even Moet, the perfectionist Moet, has been spending his own money as well as O'Brien's is screwing the Bridgetown yard out of some things here. <laughs> and he's amassed a, a bunch of gold leaf and vermilion, and he's really doing her up. Yeah, and maybe I'm looking too far ahead of the story here and, th- and seeing stuff that isn't here, but the most perfect version of the surprise is the version of the surprise that's commissioned in the Navy and is being crewed by these people. The most perfect versions of these people are the versions who are embarked on HMS Surprise, serving in the Navy and supporting each other and keeping the ship beautiful. And that's a perfection that I think we're going to see coming under threat. (laughs) Boy, that's a great point. I mean, we got reminded of that a little while earlier in this book as we kind of returned to Spotted Dick, a midshipman, the wonderful Mm. days above HMS Surprise. And now, oh, look where he's landed up and how life is for him and everything else. Yeah, fascinating. Mm. We get a bit more of the old surprise perfection getting brought into play here because she's not only being made beautiful, she's being made piratical as well. She's being turned into a man of war to go after and deceive and chase and take this privateer, this Spartan. So they've put empty casks on the deck to look like deck cargo. They've artfully made side cloths. These these cloths with painted gun ports look very obviously fake. So they look like a merchantman that's done a bad job of faking gun ports. Of course, the side cloths conceal real gun ports, but that's not the point. And they're trying to make the surprise look as much like a merchantman as possible and as little like a man of war as possible. The crew is on board with Jack's kind of piratical intentions here and this disguising. They don't mind setting all this up and striking it down. They also love gun practice. And yet another token of happiness and well-being aboard a surprise, we get Mike, a really detailed description of the regular daily drill of preparing and running out and firing and reloading the guns. And Jack is timing the broadside. And we know that he's looking to get down to three minutes, 10 seconds. We know that Jack is basically investing his own money in this practice. We learned that it's about a guinea a broadside. And that's going to start knocking a hole in Jack's 10,000 pounds. They spend their day chipping shot to make it as round as possible. And the exercise comes along. Jack sends out a raft with three barrels and a red flag. And he borrows Stephen's very expensive French chronometer with a second hand. And we get all of this lovely detail. It says, once the preliminaries were over, once the drum had beat, once the disguise had been cleared away, once all the cabin bulkheads had been knocked down so that there could be a clean sweep fore and aft with the decks wetted and sanded, damp fear naught screens over the hatchways to the magazines and all the hands at their action stations, the pigtailed members of the gun crews, and that was most of them, the surprise following the old ways, doubled their cues and tied them short. Some took off their shirts, many knotted a handkerchief round their foreheads against the sweat. Wow, that was a very long sentence with very many subsidiary clauses in it, but never mind. <laughs> they stood easy, these crew members, each in a place he knew intimately well with his own particular tackle for rammer, sponge, powder horn, wad, handspike, crow or round shot just at hand. I mean, this is like Napoleonic gunnery porn here, I'm afraid. <laughs> The lieutenants behind their divisions and the midshipmen behind behind their groups of guns and they watched the blue cutter towing the raft away over the sea. The breeze hummed gently through the rigging. Smoke from the slow match in the tubs wafted here and there about the deck. I'm like, this is one of the most thoroughly set scenes that we've had for a long time. Right. And it goes on. We've got the whole scene set up here and now we've got Bonded with his crew aiming gun number two, this long brass starboard chaser. And he's he's nodding his head and they're heaving this ton and a half cannon, just, you know, a point to the left, a point to the right. 
and they're waiting, they're waiting, you know, anxiously for this gun on their right, willful murder. When they do hear willful murder fire, uh, Brian writes, Bonded reached out his hand for the glowing match and clapped the pink end down on the touch hole, arching his body to let the instantly recoiling gun shoot inward under him. They were scarcely aware of the enormous ringing crack and the jet of flame, the flying bits of wad, the smoke and the twang of the breaching. They took them for granted as they held the gun firm, sponged it, rammed the cartridge home, the ball and the wad, and ran the piece up again with a satisfying thump. Took them as much for granted as the deeper report of number four, instantly followed by Towser number six, and so on in double quick time to 22 and 24, Jumping Billy and True Blue, which were in Jack's sleeping place in the gray cabin respectively, And as the dense white smoke that eddied in the breeze, their motions, though extremely rapid, exact, and powerful, were so nearly automatic that most of the crew had time to see the flight of their ball in the fountain of water as it pitched just under the target. A hair's breadth, a hair's breadth, muttered Bonded, bent over the reloaded pointed gun, and then he whipped the glowing match across. So, Man, I'm just like, God, this idea of all these guys, this ton and a half cannon, this thing just flying and bonding, you know, arching over the top of it and redoing all this stuff. I'm, I'm amazed at, at the way we get this cinematic view. It is really cinematic, isn't it? And on, on the cinematic note, by the way, the, the names of the guns being laid out like this, for me, has a really strong resonance with that opening tracking shot yes at the beginning of the master and commander movie where we see the guns and their names kind of scribed on them and mike do you know it also reminds me of this very very kind of lovingly detailed very very visual portrayal it reminds me a lot of the way that a uh, world war ii gunfire was portrayed in one of c.s forrester's books he wrote a book called the ship about naval battles in the mediterranean but not remotely like the hornblower books much more technocratic much more procedural and it, this had really strong echoes of that i think Night. And I think a tribute to O'Brien, we're getting all this and we're into all of it and we're loving all of it. And we're reminded that for a number of weeks, maybe they've been doing dumb show because of the cost, because of everything. But this tonight is Sophie's birthday. And that's why Jack is wanting to light the heavens up. So he's doing this for Sophie's birthday. And then we're getting all of this description like this as they go for the record. They're going to break their own record this three minutes and 10 seconds before. Yeah. And we see the shot fall home and they're absolutely flying through. They're destroying this target that's been towed out there. Jack's really excited. He's so excited he almost breaks Stephen's very expensive French watch banging it on the rail. He gives the watch to Calamy to keep time and he goes up in the shrouds to watch the next broadside. (gasps) Calamy reports, three minutes and eight seconds, sir, if you please. Yes. So, in, in Olympic week, they've broken the record by two seconds. Yes, that's right. New, new personal best world record here. <laughs> Jack loves breaking the record. He loves the accuracy even more. And he says that they should watch out, though, that if they get so ahead of each other that they end up firing in unison, that they're going to split the planking because surprise is old and fragile and she can't stand up to a broadside with each of the guns firing at once. And he wants the timbers of the surprise to stay together in anticipation of catching up with this heavy privateer, the Spartan. So our attention sort of turns to Spartan. Our attention is pointed toward the Spartan by O'Brien. And Mike, he, he does something quite particular in the way that he sets this up. So O'Brien does this very interesting thing at the next paragraph. Having mentioned the Spartan in this previous paragraph, closing out his description of the gunnery practice, He mentions it immediately in the next paragraph. And he often does this in a way that kind of changes scenes or changes point of view, but we're almost taken straight into a a very big foreshadowing. He says, they saw her three times. Whoa. So he does this announcement that what you're about to hear is the story of three sightings of the Spartan. And it's a very different narrative technique from what he's used, I think, in the rest of the book. Yeah, I don't. I don't ever remember that happening before. O- O'Brien telling us ahead of time. You know, you know, some authors kind of you know jump forward and backward in time and stuff. Some have a, a little vignette at the beginning of the book that's in the future, and now we're going to figure out how we got there. This is this is new for me. I think. Yeah, yeah, it is. I wonder who else he's been reading. Yeah. Anyhow, it raises. I mean, to me anyway. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on a minute. Three times. Right. Like, 
what do we see her miss her what's what what's going on here so he raises a little bit of curiosity in our minds the first of these sightings comes three days later. It comes a little before dawn, which we learn is that the best time for finding an enemy close at hand. It's awkward Davis, who is certain. He says it's the Spartan. He says, John Larkin, the lookout who spots her, has always been a lucky cove. And Moat, beaming in his nightshirt, asks Jack for permission to alter course. And Jack, who himself is just out of bed, grants permission and says that the ship should be pretty, to me, should be made to look nice, because he doesn't want this foreigner, this privateer, if it is her, to see them looking like Sodom and Gomorrah. Right. Now, <laughs> we close this sighted ship, we learn that it is a privateer, but it's a British one, the Prudence out of Kingston in Jamaica. And Jack realises that he knows the ship's master, this guy Ellis. And he only realises after they've been sitting talking for a while. Ellis used to command a king's ship called the Hind, and there had been a court-martial. And Ellis had been about to leave the Royal Navy and was reduced to commanding a privateer. And Ellis tells Jack about the Spartan. They're unlikely to see her, he decides, before the Azores. But Mike, this, this conversation is only slightly about intelligence about the Spartan. I think it was a lot of a message to us that there are naval characters out there who are contemporaries of Jack and who are respected by Jack, whose careers can be halted and put out of order and even broken by a court-martial or by some kind of legal process. And this is the second time now in this book that we've heard about a court-martial that's breaking someone's career. Yeah. Yeah, you got to start saying, wait a minute, are we, are we getting a theme here? What's going uh, on here? Right. Well, that night over music, Jack wonders aloud whether the infernal ptarmigan was at Ashgrove Cottage when Sam visited. Now, Stephen recognizes that a ptarmigan is, is a bird. It's a grouse. And... So he's kind of wondering, it doesn't make sense, the question. So he asks Jack what he means by ptarmigan. And Jack replies that it's a, quote, contentious, forward cross, overbearing woman you come across too often. And this stack of adjectives, like, wait a minute, that sounds familiar. Maybe past descriptions of Mrs. Williams come to mind here. Uh, but Jack mentioned some other women by name here. But as Stephen asked him more about that, Jack says that his father told him the term came from Mohammed's wife. And I've got to tell you, Ian, this is a real rabbit hole for me. So I'm, I'm, I'm like going, Mohammed's wife, Tarmigan? So I'm looking up the names of all of Mohammed's wives, and he has many, 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 many. And of course, none of them look like Tarmigan in any way, shape, or form. And, and thankfully, I'm digging in, and there's a 2008 posting on the gun room. Thank you, Don Seltzer. You know, somebody was kind of summarizing Don's answer to this thing, that Jack had confused the word ptarmigan with termagant, and that this termagant, supposedly, according to this, this gunroom posting, that this reference also occurs in post-captain, referring to Mrs. Williams. But, but I, I honestly couldn't find that reference. However, termagant works. So a little bit more digging, and I found out that during the Middle Ages, European literature mistakenly referred to kind of a pantheon of Muslim gods. And termagant, or tervagant, as it was written differently, was one of them. And that this term later came to mean a violent, overbearing, turbulent, brawling, gruesome woman, a shrew, a vixen, a virago. Um, that's, thank you, Oxford English Dictionary. Now, as it came here, Shakespeare kind of really popularized it as referring to any kind of a bullying person. But by the late 17th century, it was applied mostly to women here. Wow. And and O'Brien, you know, so we've got this this interesting, oh my gosh, so, you know, this this grouse, which, which in, in my great research, I hear is very tasty yeah, <laughs> and can yeah. change color. <laughs> But this whole misreference to the Muslims, but that it really, it seems like Mrs. Williams really, really is on Jack's mind. But it also looks like O'Brien is actually using this thing to bring up Jack's dad, to kind of remind us who Jack's dad is. And you might want to tell us a little bit more about that, right? Yeah, it's a great reminder. First of all, it seems like an innocent bit of exposition. And he's done this already in the earlier chapters. He's used little moments in the narrative to point out things that have happened in the story so far as a little bit of exposition. So we get a little reminder that General Aubrey is Jack's father and that he's a bit of a thorn in the flesh of government, that he hangs out 
with radicals and gives these inflammatory speeches in Parliament uh, against the government. He's now associated with the least reputable members of the radical movement. General Aubrey hopes that ministry will give him a plum position like a colonial governorship to shut him up. And we hear that his radical friends were devilish, clever, money-making fellows, and that he, General Aubrey, was eager, indeed avid, for wealth. So, thinking about Jack's father, Stephen wishes, by the way, that the general might choke to death on his next bite, which is very uncharacteristically savage of uh, of Stephen. Right. And this, I, there are red lights flashing around General Aubrey. You know, if you've got a careless, misguided, greedy old father who hangs out with money-making fellows, I think I think Chekhov might have put him there. Um, we, we had a post on our Facebook page going, what's with all the Chekhov references? Here's another example. Ch- Chekhov's gun. If the gun appears on the table in Act 1, it's got to be fired by Act 3. What? Grasping, greedy, ignorant general father in Chapter 3, he's got to have turned up and paid off his greediness sometime in the next couple of chapters. We all have to see. Right. Even if we have to use some lovely bird to somehow sneak the reference to General Aubrey telling his son about this in his youth yeah. to get there. You know, it was it was definitely hard work, but he does it here. And so we, we've just gotten this and this uncharacteristically, wow, you know, I hope he dies on his next bite. And we open the next scene and we're just this side of the Azores. And O'Brien tells us they see the second Spartan, and just like Pulling said, she's disguised as a Portuguese man of war. And thinking at a mile, this is a great disguise. And even at a half a mile, just before they start firing on her, Jack and Mr. Allen, who are kind of staring through their telescopes at this ship, and they, you know, they notice even the sun glinting off the crucifix right there at the main mast. That wait a minute, this is an actual Portuguese man of war. This is ah, not ah. the Spartan. And, 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 and they pause, they're like, oh my God, you know, they, they put out the slow match. Uh, Jack has the surprises, colors raised, and he invites a very angry Portuguese captain across to dine. I think these Portuguese captains like, what the hell is this ship doing, man? He is coming for me. What, you know, this is, I'm, you know, no, no, no. And so the captain comes across, he accepts Jack's apology, and he tells them about the American privateers in these waters, he tells them which ones are hardware, what they're doing, and, and says that they really don't have any idea where the Spartan is. Perhaps it's headed for the Guinea coast, or perhaps soon under the full moon, it will be off chasing some of Britain's West India men. Very good. Mm. Good to know, but frustrating, right? So three sightings of the Spartan we were promised one turned out to be a British privateer. One turned out to be a friendly man of war. Has, has all this chipping of shot been for nothing? Has this all been a waste? A broadside in three minutes and eight seconds? Are, are we ever going to get to put that to use? I think, Mike, we're going to have to take a break here. I think some of our listeners might want to go and chip a few round shot of their own, perhaps even see if they can manage two Roman Cokes in three minutes and eight seconds. <laughs> what a great idea. Yeah. And we'll see what happens next. Brilliant. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole. So welcome back, everybody. We are aboard the surprise. We're with Jack and Stephen, and we are chasing the Spartan. Or at least we hoped to be chasing the Spartan. We've seen her, what we thought was her, twice. We've practiced our gunnery till we're blue in the face but still no sign. Mike, are we ever going to get to see this pesky ship? Well, in fact, they see their third Spartan northwest of the Azars in a morning haze and a calm sea. Fascinatingly, after having been kind of on their tiptoes the whole time, at this point, the crew and, and even Jack are a little bit tired of these false sightings, and they don't pay particular attention to this ship. But as the light strengthens, Jack looks a little more closely and sees that this thing that looks like a Portuguese man of war, with him having just seen an actual one, 
is really not disguised as well as it thinks it is. So she looks like she's fast. She looks like she's heavily armed. She really matches up to Pooling's description. And when she sees the surprise, she claps her Helma Lee, a move which could give her the weather gauge later. And Jack thinks that a real Portuguese man of war would have no reason to do that. So Jack, now convinced of her identity, has the surprise and her crew look more and more like merchantmen. He says, keep a lot of people down, don't pipe up hammocks, and let's kind of get on a course which looks innocent but might give us the weather gauge over time. So, you know, we've got this duel starting. How can I kind of look innocent but see if I can't get myself in a position to be able to command the attack here? Yeah. And... This sounds like a classic Jack Aubrey chase moment, right? How to right. creep up and gain the advantage without being seen to creep up and gain the advantage. Now, that would be difficult enough if there were any regular old kind of ship, any regular old kind of merchantman or potential prize. But I think we might have a challenge or two on our hands here. This is the Spartan, and we believe they've got a bit of a reputation. And the seas are calm, so it's difficult maintaining this apparent sort of nonchalance and still managing to creep up to weather in such calm seas. The Spartan can continue to act like a man of war, but Jack has to pretend to be a midshipman. That means he can't use all of his sails. He can't use all of his rigging. He can't use anything that looks like, you know, efficient, fast, effective seamanship. So he has to keep fewer men on deck. He has to look like he's handling the sails with less skill. The Spartan gets closer, but Jack doesn't want to risk his men or his ship in outright gunnery action with a privateer. He wants to stay far away. He wants to throw off his disguise at the last minute from a windward position and use his long guns at the right time to basically bring them to a quick surrender. The Spartan has 42-pounder carronades, and if he gets up close, they're going to make a mess. Right. So he notices these cat's paws of wind on the surface of the sea, and he's playing his way in and out of these cat's paws, these little puffs of wind. There's a luffing match. A luffing match is where the two boats are trying to creep up to windward of each other. Anybody who's been watching the Olympic sailing these last couple of weeks, you'll have seen a few luffing matches going on. Much of Jack's crew are following it from below. They're getting whispered secondhand reports from the crew who are remaining on deck down below into the, uh, into the lower decks where the crew are hiding. Jack hopes to be far enough away before the wind picks up again and allows him to get the Spartan under his lee. He has Bonden to go down and invite Stephen and Martin to come up and see if they want to see this perfect calm, what he calls a clock calm. But Mike, that this doesn't seem to be something that excites Stephen and Dr. Martin. No, no, it really doesn't. As a matter of fact, they've been taking advantage of this calm. They're in the gun room and they have now put out their entire Cleoptera their entire range of beetles and specimens all across the gun room. It says it's covered the entire floor. It's covered all the tables. And Bondin accidentally steps on some of this stuff and then backs up, you know, when he's cursed at and steps on some more and knocks them down. And, and he kind of comes back and isn't quite sure what to say to Jack here. But he reports that Martin and Stephen say that they have Absolutely no desire to come whistle or scratch a backstay to help increase the win unless Jack orders them to. And Jack, listening to this, also notices that the Spartan looks like it's about to lower boats. And as he sees that, the Spartan fires a heavy cannonade. The ball is true. It heads towards the surprise. It skips 10 times, but then it goes under the surface before it reaches the surprise. So... Jack thinks that she's trying to kind of intimidate the surprise. This, you know, obviously she must think that he's a merchant man. Uh, you know, he's convinced the surprise is innocence. And, you know, he thinks that she's likely going to now lower her boats, turn the Spartan so she gets a better set of firing at the surprise. And given a chance, she'll row towards him and board. So he's, yeah. he's concerned here. Yeah, and meanwhile, below decks on the surprise, Martin is mulling over the set of specimens that he's got with Stephen. He says, well, where are those ones that we set aside? And Stephen says, oh, they're over there. They're for Joseph Blaine. And Mike, it's another little weird moment of re-exposition because Stephen gets to give this little explanation to Nathaniel Martin, who, by the way, I, I would have guessed that Martin would have known who Blaine was, but never mind. It's a little, little moment of, uh, of basil exposition. There for Joseph Blaine, and we get this explanation about how he's a man in Whitehall who's very important, but his major passion when he's not at work 
is entomology. And he promises to introduce Martin as soon as they get back. And Stephen's thinking there about how much he wants to see Sir Joseph so that he can get rid of this brass box, the brass box that they captured out of the packet to Dane back, what, a book and a half ago now. Right. Huh. So, meanwhile, back on deck, Jack has the crew begin to throw off their disguise. They throw the casks over the side. They strip off the side cloths. They launch their own boat to turn the surprise. Just as the Spartan has done, they want to turn the surprise's head round so that they can bring their guns to bear. Um, Mike, this is, this is a terrible, funny, but terrible couple of paragraphs to read here. Yes. Because the crew's efficiency fails them. A tackle is jammed as they're putting one of the boats overside. The boat can't be launched. A second cutter, though, is quickly put over the side. A breeze from the west comes up and reaches the Spartan, who is now suspicious about exactly who this is, the surprise, and starts to run away. Jack asks the gunner to fire a ball across the Spartan's bows, and I think he also says, if that doesn't answer, then put one through her full topsail. Right. Awkward Davis. Awkward Davis, this old, old, old familiar member of the ship's company, dedicated Jack Aubrey follower, is at the head of this launched cutter, stands in the boat, which had already taken up too much water on being launched rather heavy-handedly, grabs the tow line, and in a moment of madness, not realizing quite where he is, reaches out to heave on the tow line, puts his foot on the gunwale of the boat, and as anybody knows who's ever stepped on the gunwale of, a, of an unballasted small boat, he tips it over. <laughs> and this must have been like very a very slapstick moment to, to behold, but it's come at the worst possible time. People who can't swim jump in after others who also couldn't swim. <laughs> Jack and others save them. He pulls a couple of his followers out of the out of the sea himself. Jack comes back on deck, and now the Spartan is a great way off. Despite all of this, they try to fire a broadside, but to no avail. The accuracy that was there in the gunnery practice a few paragraphs ago has failed them, and the shot are very, very poorly grouped, and the Spartan's unscathed. And... Mike, the, the really telling payoff of all of this is the crew looking back at Jack with what we read are these collective expressions of guilt and almost humiliation. This really steady crew of men who've worked together for years, very dedicated to ship, very dedicated to Jack. They've let the ship down and they've let Jack down. And all of those earlier worries and superstitions that we had about Jack's luck ebbing and flowing Ah, maybe this is the moment when the tide turns. Yeah, you know, it's funny, Ian, because as intense as this is, as you say, O'Brien almost writes it up slapstick. I mean, you know, on that boat with Awkward Davis is Howard, who we've been set up a couple of times down in the book to realize he's the guy who lost all his teeth, the young midshipman. Yeah. He's trying to tell Davis what to do. We've had an example earlier in the book that yeah. he's almost impossible to understand. He's very, you know, with his gumming, his words and everything. So it's like, oh my gosh, if you see this scene kind of played out, and I, I you know, I, I think it's part of the audible thing because when Patrick Tall reads Howard speaking, he kind of mumbles it, mumbles it and everything. But it's awful. It is just a letdown. I mean, they're right there. And now this change in fortune. And you're wondering, you know, how is Jack going to react? And, and obviously, as you say, the crew is wondering, how is Jack going to react? They're very nervous looking at him. Jack is like right to, OK, what do we do about this now? He has got to figure out a way to make up the miles between the two ships. And as these hands are all suffering from collective guilt, Jack's orders are cold and impersonal, but he's not swearing. He's yeah. not harsh. And they're so into obeying them. For what example, when he asked the sails to be sprayed with the water pump, they pump so hard that the water goes beyond the royal. So usually they've got to carry buckets up to get to these things. No, no, no. They're pumping as hard as they can go here. And as the moon rises, they see the Spartan is ahead, but it's no longer gaining. I just am fascinated always, by the way, O'Brien writes, but these little back and forth and back and forth. So as this is happening, Jack notices that Stephen and Martin are standing quietly by, kind of on the edge of the quarter deck, smiling at Jack like they want him. And, and Jack walks over to Stephen and Stephen says, you know, I'm sorry for the calm. 
but he invites Jack to see this incredible display of Beatles before they have to pack it all away for the gunroom dinner. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, my God, Stephen, you know, what kind of moment is this? You know, we got to get the Spartan here. And what does Jack say? Jack says, that would give me great pleasure. I'm thinking, wow, who is this guy? I mean, this guy has matured. This guy has grown. This guy has got great self-awareness. You know, and instead of going, I called you up here a while ago to help us, but no, you didn't come. No, no, that would give me great pleasure. And Jack checks the sales and then he walks away with Stephen and Martin to go to the gun room and, and says basically, and hey, you know, and if the gun room could invite me for a little bread and cheese after that, that would just make my day, do my heart good and everything. So <laughs> I, I just love this. It's amazing here. Ah, uh, yeah. I'm realizing here that right before he leaves the deck with, with Stephen and Martin, he does ask for word to be sent to Killick to get him an elbow chair a night glass and a boat cloak for when he returns to the deck. So he's going off with Martin and Steven. He's assuring them, you know, I want a little bread and cheese, but first I want to see the bugs. And, and we know how Jack feels about beetles. So this is really gracious Jack. But in his mind, he already has the night planned out. And this is what's going to happen when I return here. And Mike, it's, it's really striking that in this chapter, we get very little dialogue. Yes. Yeah. It's almost like, you know, watching a, like one of those really hard boiled 1970s movies, like The French Connection or something, where all we're getting is action and procedure and stuff happening and things falling into place. We're getting very little dialogue between the characters, which is a big contrast, I think, from the earlier chapters. So we don't hear the dialogue that takes place. We're not invited into Jack going to see the, the beetles and the bugs and the butterflies. We go straight back to Jack being on deck, and he's on deck all night walking to the barrows to check on the Spartan. Um, he's watching her maintain her lead, perhaps increase that lead a little bit. He really admires her captain, although the captain doesn't get a name, interestingly, and wonders if he can keep this up if the weather turns dirty. In a blow, he thinks, he would send up hawsers and cablets to the mastheads, and that would be an advantage for the surprise. And we read that at four bells in the middle watch, the breeze hauled a little forward, so that Jack filled the mainsail. But apart from that, both ships raced over the sea with never a change, as though they were running in a timeless dream. And in the morning, you know, we get these just episodes where Jack turns back to have some social connection with somebody else in the ship. In the morning, he asks Killick to invite Stephen and Martin to dinner. He tells Mr. Allen, the officer of the watch, to wake him if there's any change in the weather or the chase. And he sleeps for a few hours. And Mike, a couple of things are very striking here. As well as the no dialogue thing, the Spartan herself is just a Spartan. Right. She's the, the captain's not being given a name or any kind of personal attributes. The crew are not directly being talked about or given any kind of attributes. This is this is shaping up to be a very impersonal chase through the day and into the night. Well, just the phrase that you just read, it says as though they were running in a timeless dream. And you do have this kind of like, it's sort of unreal, surreal, because like you said, we don't have Jack looking through the telescope, seeing the captain of the Spartan looking through his telescope. We don't, you know, it is, there's just this ghost out there. And it's kind of like, it's taken on a life of its own a little bit here. Yeah, And it kind of continues later on back on deck. After Jack's taken his nap, uh, the sun's come up here and here that the chase looks the same in sunlight, much as it did in the moonlight, and that this dreamlike chase continues. And O'Brien writes, although there was the prevailing sense of urgency and even crisis, and although there was the engine in the top squirting with all its might, while the brass long nine stood ready on the forecastle trained right forward with their garlands of smooth shot beside them, there was remarkably little to do. Mm -hmm. With the perfect steadiness of the breeze, it was like rolling down the trades to the Cape, never touching sheet or brace for days and even weeks on end. But whereas in the trades, there was always cleaning, painting ship, washing clothes, making and mending, all these other things, churches and division, here, they're just making wads and shipping the round shot. And he says further, so to the click, click of 50 or 60 hammers, the surprise ran on, going as fast as the most careful attention to Brace and Helm could drive her, pursuing a chase that lay perpetually 
halfway to a horizon that perpetually receded before both of them. So like you say, and this is this is kind of amazing here. Yeah. This whole dreamlike quality. And, and I'm right there with this prevailing sense of urgency and crisis, not just about the Spartan, but you know, how are things going at home with Diane and Sophie? You know, what about Jack? Has he grown too old? Has he lost his luck? What about this last chance for the surprise to kind of show her colors before being laid up? I'm kind of feeling like all this hangs in the balance with this chase, but it's this kind of ghost, this sort of ethereal dreamlike thing, you know, kind of one of those nightmares I used to have about getting pulled over in a, in a small town and you know, <laughs> for no reason and all of a sudden finding myself, you know, locked away. And it's like, Everybody is related to one another. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Now, this ethereal quality doesn't seem to be bothering Jack yet. Because O'Brien tells us, again, we get this reported by O'Brien without any dialogue, really, from Jack or even any interior I, monologue. We read that it was to the distant accompaniment of this sound. This is the, the 50 or 60 hammers chipping away at shot. It was to this accompaniment that Jack and his guests ate their dinner. Shaved and shining after a catnap, Jack was in fine form. Yesterday's intense frustration belonged to history. He had not felt so well or so alive since the horrible days of the court-martial. He enjoyed his company. So, Mike, this is, this is Jack feeling on top of what? On top of the world? On top of his game? Maybe on top of his life? We're very far up, I think, in Jack's character, and it really makes me worried for what might be going to happen. <laughs> right! And we, it's noticeable that this would normally be an occasion where we get the inside scoop on this dinner. Jack, at the pivotal moment in a long chase, sitting down to dinner with Stephen and Martin, there'd be some witticisms, there would be some mishandled pleasantries, there would be some ill-timed flings against the Pope, there'd be some food, there would be a glass of wine with you, sir, there would be a Marine getting drunk, there would be all of these kind of sap, but we don't get any of this stuff. We just get as very bold secondhand report that the meal took place and that Jack was feeling great, that he's glad for the conversation with Stephen and Martin. They know better than to speak their minds at the captain's table and Jack is not subdued around Martin as he had been since Sam appeared. So Jack is glad that the weather's getting worse. He really anticipates a good, strong weather chase. And there's almost a, a hostage to fortune in the text here. This is O'Brien reporting what Jack is thinking about. It says, a chase in sight, his ship in perfect order, and a blow coming on. This was real sailoring. This was why men went to sea. And Mike, I'm really grateful that this is O'Brien reporting this and that it's not Jack's actual words, because if these are Jack's actual words, he needs to touch wood he needs to grasp a belaying yes. pin as he says these things here yeah this is this is we're back to the early part of the chapter where we're saying that these are the kind of things that, that get you out of luck you know when you're just a little bit too boastful a little bit too thing and and we get a little bit more about this you know we o'brien's already told us that normally dinner with the captain everybody waits till the captain speaks but martin and, and Stephen, they're not like that they just you get you know yammer away they're all happy all three of them talking away and they're listening to Jack talk about the Spartan, how probably she's running for breast. And he thinks a possibility of catching her before Ushant and all the reefs and islands that would be really troublesome there. But O'Brien, again, now not hearing the dialogue so much, but reporting that Jack's bright blue, cheerfully predatory eye tells Martin and Stephen that perhaps Jack's a little less cautious about victory that he's letting on. And Martin kind of breaks in and he says that the engine pumping water on the sails from behind are surely increasing the ship's speed. Stephen says there's no doubt about it. And he starts to quote Dryden, you know, our fa favorite poet Dryden here. Yeah. Stephen says, when virtue spooms before a prosperous gale, my heaving wishes help to fill the sail. So he's kind of piling on to these. They're pumping the water, which is pushing the sails. Here's Dryden about virtue spoons here and my heaving wishes. And now, interestingly, we had had Ellis, who used to captain the hind. And this verse comes from Dryden's poem, The Hind and the Panther. 
And so wow. it's like, oh, we've got a couple of Heinz here. I think we've had a few Heinz and Diana the Huntress. And anyway, so I go to Dryden's Hind and Panther. And I think, well, let me see. Maybe there's something bigger going on here. And, and O'Brien's pointing us back to us. But this is like a 2600 line allegory. So it's an allegory, not easy to figure those out. And mm-hmm. it's in heroic couplets. And, and it happens to have been written after Dryden converted to Catholicism when James II ascended to the throne in, in 1685. So he's using this allegory of beasts to compare Roman Catholics of Milky White Hind, the Church of England, a panther, Presbyterians are a wolf, Quakers are a hare. We've got lots of other faiths and, and philosophers and thinkers of the time. So I think we don't even go there. Uh, if, if O'Brien is doing that, my gosh, this is this is way beyond me. But we've got this thing when virtue spoons and spoons. So I'm kind of saying, what does that mean? And actually, so you go back to a lot of sea grammars of the time and before, and a ship spoons. This is from a 1691 Siemens grammar. It's when a ship goes right before the wind without any sail. Hmm. And this gets without any sail or a little bit of sail that the, the sea is moving, the ship is moving, the wind is there, but we don't have any sails to catch it right now. So everybody kind of commenting on this poem later in this one verse says, well, wait a minute, my heaving wishes help to fill the sail, you know, when virtue spooms before a prosperous scale. Well, in this case, spooming, there's no sail. So So this thing is really, you know, you're kind of scratching your head here going, I don't get it. What's going on? And and I don't know, you know, maybe we're wrapped in this dreamlike chase in this dreamlike chapter. And I'm thinking maybe this is way too much. But the sea pushed by a prosperous gale, prosperous, prosperous is like making lots of money. My heaving wishes filling the sail. Wait a minute. Is this somebody thinking of financial gain? A storm of financial gain pushing somebody's virtue along, perhaps out of the way because of their heaving wishes, you know, Jack maybe wanting to be set up again. I, I don't know. This all seems very metaphysical to me, Ian. I, 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 what, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's very metaphysical. And by the way, some people around the dinner table have got completely the wrong end of the stick, including Stephen and Martin. Right. That hosing down the sails isn't to provide kinetic energy to the sails. It's to make them less porous so that they don't let the wind through. Um, it has nothing to do with the kinetic energy of water. Right. Um, Stephen could stand on the quarterdeck and blow as hard as he liked into the sail, but since he's standing on the deck of the ship, him blowing onto the sails of the ship isn't going to have any e- effect. So nobody understands the physics here. I think we've got to fall back on metaphysics. And spooming sounds like a pretty good allegory for some of the things that are going on in the book right now. So having flashed out this Dryden quote, Stephen makes light of it. We haven't heard the end of Dryden, but for now, Stephen makes light of it. He says, the deer knows we spoon in the most virtuous manner. I suggest we all go and blow into the mainsail, which is this lack of physical knowledge that I think I'm talking about here. Some blow while others just tie her up to the back of the ship and pull forwards as hard as ever can be. Ha ha ha. So maybe he kind of realizes yes. that he's breaking the laws of physics. Anyhow, we've strayed very far away from the real and concrete world. I'm not sure how Jack is feeling about all of this. Um, if I was Jack, I'd be getting a bit impatient. <laughs> with his line of conversation but they're trying to keep each other's spirits up they're trying to have fun with each other Stephen chokes while he's laughing and when he recovers martin is telling jack about dryden dying poor and the miseries of other authors and besides being a little pob going off on one about the poverty and the, the ill treatment of authors this is a story of somebody's career ending in ignominy and poverty right ha huh. And this is a thing that we might come back to later on. Meanwhile, they're, they're all called on deck to go and look at a parcel of bankers, a bunch of uh, cod fishing boats that are um, on their way to fish the Newfoundland banks. On deck, O'Brien a, a points out this contrast between the peaceful, slow, kind of slovenly industry of these bankers, these fishing boats, and the striving of war, these two ships trying to eat the heart out of each other's wind, trying to get through the, uh, get through the breeze and get to windward. Anticipating a possible blow then, Jack changes sails. He strikes the carronades down into the hold. He tries to change the ship's trim and starts 10 tonnes of water over the side. And Mike, I think this means that Jack thinks the chase is just getting started. 
Right, right. It certainly sounds like he's in earnest now after all this silliness with Stephen and Martin and all these kind of mm, a little bit ominous, kind of not quite understanding things bubbling up. Water's going on the side. We're going for her here. Yeah. As the moon rises, the wind increases. Jack's been waiting and hoping for this. Surprise reduces sail and increases speed. And we're hearing this report out from six and a half knots to then over time, 10 knots. And Jack watches the Spartan who, O'Brien tells us, appears black in the moonlight. And, and Jack, time from time, he takes the wheel. He's getting the feel of the ship. And at first breakfast, the barometer continues to fall. And the gale, while not super heavy yet, has turned stiff. And mow it notes that the Spartan has sent hawsers aloft. And Jack had been thinking earlier, this is great, because if there's a blow, we're going to be able to do this, and that'll give us a leg up. So here's Jack's classic move. We've rarely seen it on any other ship. And Jack, having thought about it before, hasn't done it yet. So Jack says, has she? The wicked dog. Come have a cup of coffee to keep your spirits up, Moet. Then we shall go on deck where virtue spooms before the goddamn gale, and our heaving wishes will help to fill the sail. Ha, ha, ha. That's driving, you know. (laughs) And and now I'm starting to wonder a little bit whether Jack has a complete hold on reality here. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's he's gibbering a little bit, I think. He's gone gone a bit driving crazy, as, as clearly any of us could do. Um, right. Meanwhile, he's he's actually behind the game here. The Spartan has put horses and cables to her mastheads, and Jack has to play catch up. He's going to do the same now. He gets her cables and horses up, but it takes a while to get it done. The Spartan draws ahead, and the wind is blowing more and more over time. The surprise is getting closer to the Spartan again. She's the faster ship. She's in the heavier sea. But Jack is concerned that nightfall is coming. And if they don't catch up with the Spartan by nightfall, they're going to lose her in the dark. And Mike, it's interesting that the the Spartan is described as being a black ship on the horizon. Again, we're getting this idea of the Spartan as some kind of a ghost ship, an abstraction. Anyway, meanwhile, Jack and Midshipman Howard are guests of the gun rooms for dinner. And another meal with very, very little description, very, very little dialogue reported to us. The meal actually is changed because of the early extinction of the galley fire. So they're back to plain fare. Um, Stephen goes back to the miseries of the authors um, that Martin had mentioned earlier. He mentions a guy called Michael Adamson, a naturalist author, author of many, many volumes classifying all known beings and all known species, a person acclaimed by the Academy for his contribution to biology and zoology, received industry accolades, Linnaeus, the great systematic biologist of the world, names the baobab tree after him. And when Adamson is invited to become a member of the Institute in Paris, which is a, a body that invited Stephen Maturin to speak to them, he can't go because he doesn't have a whole shirt or untorn breeches. So this guy is living in poverty in rags. And Martin starts out on another story, but Jack misses some of these stories. He's paying attention to the ship, to the shifting of the wind and the weather and the sea. And when he returns to the conversation, he hears Stephen say, Smollett observed that had his friends told him what to expect in the capacity of an author, I should in all probability have spared myself the incredible labour and chagrin that I have undergone. Martin says, think of Ovid on the dank and fetid shores of the old cold black sea. Omnia perdidimus, tantum moda vita relicta est. Prebeat ut sensum materiamoque mali. Mike, I can pronounce Latin but I can't translate it. Tell us what's going on there. Well, it's fascinating. Here we've got Ovid thrown on shore, if you will. (laughs) And and this line, now a guide for the perplex, which is is where the translation that we get in the wiki POB did. Anthony Gary Brown translates these lines as, we have lost everything. And to the extent that life is left, it offers just the sense and substance of evil. I thought, wow, that's a yeah, you know, that's a dark line, but I'm not really sure that it fits in with everything, that, you know, the line we just heard from Stephen and everything. So we dig a little deeper. And the Leo Classics offers another translation, and, and I pulled out the paragraph from which these lines are drawn. And in this one, it says, So malice ceased to tear one banished from his country. Scatter not my ashes, cruel one. I have lost all. 
life alone remains to give me the consciousness and the substance of sorrow. What oh. pleasure to thee to drive the steel into limbs already dead. There is no space in me now for a new wound. Now this, this very wow. different translation here. And then, you know, doing a little research, we learned that when Ovid wrote this poem, this is one of his last, you know, he's in exile. You know, he's lost his patron. He's speaking about his muse in the past tense that I'm not going to be writing anymore. Yeah. You know, I'll no longer be able to write poetry. And now, you know, I'm thinking back that we've got all these stories about these people who've been renowned and talented in their field and who die with nothing or have nothing in the midst of their accomplishments. Stephen's line about Smollett, this thing about Ovid having been kind of thrown on the beach. I'm wondering, is all this referring to Jack's career? Is this referring about the chase of the Spartan? And especially with this thing about throwing on the beach and this extended translation about Ovid, I'm going, my God, this could be some pretty deep foreshadowing here. Now, it could just yeah. be O'Brien talking about life as an author here. Yep. But but why why is this all done with so many different examples, repeated so often to this degree it seems like, you know, you talked about cinephiles, plants and payoffs. We're yeah, getting some yeah. pretty heavy plants here. And we've got to ask ourselves, will there be payoffs here? Oh, yeah. Ha. Huh. Now, none of that is occurring yet to any of Jackson Media's company. No, no, no. Because Moet's just chatting away here. He turns to Stephen and Martin and says, well, surely there are some happy authors. And Stephen and Martin look doubtful. Meanwhile, there's a minor catastrophe, potentially a major catastrophe on deck. There's a roar, and Calamy runs in, reporting that the chase has split her foresail. <gasps> Maybe we have a chance. Ooh. That's how Pullings had got away from the Spartan when he was being chased by her. She split her foresail. The surprise has gained more than a mile. Jack thinks that if he can gain just five or 600 yards, he can cut up her rigging with his chasers. He can lay aboard her before nightfall. <gasps> But the surprise is rolling heavily and pitching. She needs to fire soon if she's going to fire. He decides to shake out the reefs from his main topsail and have the gunner stand by. Soon they're making 11 and a half knots. Jack and the men are all delighted. The Spartan's starting her water over the side. And then, right forward, just as the ship was reaching the height of her rise, the gunner let fly. At almost the same moment, an extraordinarily violent gust split the surprise's main topsail. Wow. Whoa. Tale of two topsails. Right. So the surprises, um, the crew take care of this efficiently. There are no harsh words exchanged. They calmly get the rags of the old main topsail furled in and they set a replacement sail. But while all this is going on, the Spartan regains her lead and she's heading into the thick gray weather ahead. And it looks likely that she'll soon be gone. The moon isn't going to rise until later. That gives them less light. And Jack, meanwhile, decides he's going to crack on. I think he's going to double down on this whole situation. The wind's backing. The wind's coming around more from the southwest, which is the kind of classic wind direction for a big gale in the North Atlantic. He thinks that hanging in on through a big gale could be his advantage over the slightly smaller ship. He's worried, though, about running the ship into the rocks of Ushant because it's nightfall. He's been here before. He's been out in his longitude in not that many books ago with, without a chronometer fix and, and got shipwrecked. So his mind, he quickly does a calculation on dead reckoning, on distance run based on the heaving of the log, and he's pretty sure that they're not going to reach the shore of Ushant until at least midnight, even at the high speed that they're going right now. So he packs on more sail. He's making almost 13 knots. And Mike, I, I don't know how into hydrodynamics Patrick O'Brien was, but there's a formula for calculating what's called hull speed. Hull speed is the speed at which a, a ship or a boat can go without needing extra power to kind of climb up over its bow wave and plane. Mm -hmm. So an so old sailing ship, in heavy in displacement mode, has a, has a hull speed of 14 knots. So at 13 knots, he's going about as fast as the surprise can be made to go. Now, that ought to be taking full advantage of our waterline length, and I would guess that she's a little bigger than the Spartan, but maybe not that much. So running 13 knots, she's pretty close to maximum speed. Any smaller ship than the Spartan, I think, surprise would have beaten her by now, but the Spartan is hanging in there. She throws her cannons overboard, 
we can see very dimly at a distance that they're dragging these cannons across the rocking ship, which must have been a really intimidating thing to have done in a ship in a storm at sea. She jettisons her boats then, and the surprise is still running a knot faster. Watching her battle lanterns, Jack is thinking, if we can keep her in sight for half an hour, we'll have her. And like 15 minutes runs by. The last of the Spartans' guns go over the side. She douses her lights in a little echo of her next episode in Master and Commander and in the movie. They can still see her wake, and then she's gone, lost in the driving gale. Whoa. Or seems Whoa. to be. Right. So then all of a sudden, the foretop calls, just a little while later, she's hauled her wind. And as the squall parts, they see the Spartan, just a faint ghost, five points off her course. I have her now, says Jack. But now the squall clearing farther still showed a greater ship nearer by far a three-decker wearing an admiral's top lantern and more ships beyond her. And as the three-decker fired, sending a ball across the surprise's forefoot, Jack realized that he was in the midst of the Channel Fleet and that the Spartan had slipped through and was on her way to Brest, unseen in the squall. Oh, man. (laughs) Well, Mike, we, we began the story of this voyage across the Atlantic with Jack and his crew moaning about Admiral Pellew taking part of their prize money, we end with another as yet unnamed Admiral bringing the chase to a halt and saying, Captain, repair a board flag. Oh, yeah, I can't believe it. That, right. That, all that chasing, all that tension, all that description, all that kind of procedural stuff, and in the end, nothing happened. Right. Nothing I, happened. You know, <laughs> amazing to be kind of right on the edge of your seat all this stuff going on loving reading it and all seemingly for naught these echoes of the lost luck haunting us again here yeah ah jack had read the signal this is captain repair aboard flag jack had read the signal before it was reported to him he looked at the grayness where the spartan had been He looked at the mountainous sea between him and the flagship, a pool of half a mile into the teeth of the gale, caught Moat's shocked and anxious eye. And Mike, this is is a cute little joke to to close the chapter with. He opened his mouth, but discipline was too strong, too deep-rooted, and he shut it again. Your barge, sir? asked Moat. No, said Jack. The blue cutter. She is more seaworthy. She may swim and he thinks to himself but he doesn't say as long as awkward davis doesn't lose his head and stand on the gunnel again right right and it is killing me because when when jack gave his private signal and made his number it signaled enemy in the east northeast and and he's waiting for the admiral ship to get back to him the admiral ship doesn't change course doesn't do anything just you know tells him oh yeah you come talk to me and like you say boy this is this is another admiral that i haven't met yet but i want to throttle <laughs> very good <sighs> so mike is is this it for the surprise now that she's you know she's within sight of the home fleet she's sort of really back within the the orbit of the navy back within the orbit of her home port this feels like gravity is bringing her back toward the end of her life as a ship of the navy has Jack missed his last chance for distinction, his last chance for this crew to make a big payoff? Mm-hmm. Has it all been cut short because of another admiral blocking, basically? Yeah. You know, we've been wrestling this whole time with Jack's luck hold. Maybe the surprises, even though they believe it might have gone out, they might pull him through. Maybe they'll change his luck. I keep thinking. But it looks like bad luck appears to have had its way. Like you say, now it's not the Spartan that's the big nemesis here. It's the Royal Navy herself. It's this admiral who, you know, as we think back, is often somebody on the other puffed up side of the desk who's not really as good as Jack. It's just more senior, just older, uh, you know, perhaps had some more interest behind them earlier on here. And, And whoever this is allows the Spartan to escape. It just appears to care less. So like you say, is that it? Is this all for the surprise here? Gosh. So this admiral, instead of taking a 12th of the prize, has really kind of negated any ability to get it. And we still have these big overriding questions here, especially, as you say, we're getting close to home here. Yeah. 
So what, what do you think, Mike? Maybe the only thing for it is to turn another page and pick up another chapter. What do you say next time to a little bit more Patrick O'Brien? I would like that of all things. to turn another page and pick up another chapter what do you say next time oh with all my heart wait 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 wait. let me get to the end of the question <laughs> oh god i'm sorry god I'm, we've been going too long here yes uh, it. thank you yes uh, uh, it. what do you say to a little bit more patrick o'brien i would like that of all things thank you ian <laughs>